The new prospect, welcome to RTB 2021 for March 5th, 2021. Uh, so our text for today, I uh, hope you're doing well, by the way. Our texts for today are Exodus 16, and then we have Luke 19, Job 34, uh, and then finally 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 4. Uh, so let's dive right, in, right into these texts. So Job 34 is um, another uh, chapter in El Elihu's uh, response to Job. And again, kind of like yesterday, if you remember yesterday, he was citing some of Job's same arguments uh, and refuting them. And here he's doing kind of the same thing. Uh, Job had been claiming that he, you know, of course, he is innocent and that, um, you know, God is treating him wrongly. And verse 10, for instance, uh, Job or Lehu says, listen to me, you, you men of understanding, far be it from God to do wickedness from the Almighty to do wrong, for he repays he pays the man according to his work, he makes him uh, find it according to his way. So in other words, uh, Job, you're experiencing this because God is being righteously judging you. Uh, he, he repays you according to your work, and so your work must have been, must have been unrighteous, and therefore you're suffering. Um, so that's it's kind of the same uh, arguments being made. And again, remember the, the purpose of these speeches of Elihu is to give uh, kind of some um, uh, culmination of all the arguments that have been being a summary of the synopsis of the, all the arguments being made in the book. Uh, let's turn over to Exodus uh, chapter 16. Uh, now, we didn't actually talk about this yesterday, but um, here in Exodus 16, it kind of continues the journey from um, from Egypt to, to Mount Sinai, and uh, along that journey, you're going to have um, you're going to have three instances of Israel complaining and grumbling. Uh, so first is at uh, Mara, uh, where they're complaining about uh, not having the water, and then you have, of course, God providing the manna for them, uh, and then later on, uh, you have. Uh, another complaint for water in chapter 17 and it's all it's always characterized as Israel grumbling uh, so they're not they're not uh, showing too much gratitude to God for their his provision for them um, and you know they're they're uh, they're constantly uh, making these extreme statements like in verse 3 would that we have died by the Lord's hand in the land of Egypt uh, and when we had sat by pots of meat and we ate bread to the full and you've got all these uh, great things. They look back at, at Egypt as this great, uh, great experience for them. But of course, uh, I think one of the, one of the leading causes of um, one of the, the leading problems, I guess you could say uh, for Christians is a lack of contentment. And I think of, for instance, in Philippians where Paul, uh, talks about how he is content in all things, even though he is imprisoned, right? Uh, even though he is undergoing great, great suffering, uh, he can be content in all things. And yet here are these, these Israelites coming out of who, who experienced the, the majestic saw, even, even um, beheld with their own eyes, the great salvation of God. And yet they're still uh, grumbling and complaining. Um, and, it, it takes, of course, a, a God-centered perspective to change that, that kind of attitude. So it's a helpful warning, I guess you could say, to read through a book like this. And it's always also good to, to re remind yourself, okay, how would the original audience have heard this type of thing or read this? And I think they would have read it in the same way that, for instance, the author of Hebrews reads this text. Uh, don't be like them. Right? Don't be like this generation of grumbling and complaining against God. And but instead, uh, have your heart filled with gratitude for what God has indeed done for us. Uh, that brings us to, uh, we'll move over to the Gospel of Luke. And you've got a number of, of really well-known stories here. You've got, of course, Zacchaeus, who, um, who has that uh, famous song. I'm not going to sing it for you. Uh, that goes along with it. And that we all learned as, as children. Um, but what always struck me about the story of Zacchaeus is, of course, how uh, it almost mirrors the proper response of anyone who's coming to, to saving faith in Christ, right? You, uh, you see 
try to he's trying to see Jesus, uh, and Jesus uh, uh, comes to him, doesn't he? And uh, God came to all of us in our in our sin and our rebellion. Um, and uh, then in verse ten, you have that that statement of Jesus said that he came to seek and save that which was lost. Remember what we talked about in chapter 15, what is it that is lost? Uh, those people who are in need of repentance um, from their, uh, from their, their pre previous way of life. And here is, of course, Zacchaeus is the same. He's kind of the, the prodigal son, the lost coin, the, uh, the, the lost that needs to be found. Uh, then, of course, at the end, we have the triumphal entry and then the, the driving of the money changers out from the temple. Uh, if you have a Bible that is a reference Bible, you'll notice that when he drives the money changers out from the temple and also in the triumphal entry, uh, there are quotations from the Old Testament. In both cases, I think the Old Testament, I don't have time to go into it now, but the Old Testament is the key to understanding those passages, particularly in the driving out of the money changers from the temple. Basically, by quoting the Old Testament there, Jesus, in a sense, is calling, uh, by calling them a, a robber's den, he's he is basically comparing the Jewish leaders of that day, uh, the temple authorities of that day, to the same, uh, he, that same phrase is used in the book of Jeremiah, when Jeremiah calls the temple authorities of his day, the leaders of his day, uh, who, had, who had led the Israelites into exile, um, Jesus is basically equating the Jewish leaders of, of his day with the Jewish leaders of Jeremiah's day by using that same phrase. And you see why they were angry with him and tried to kill him. So uh, those are important things to pay attention to. And that finally leads us to uh, 2 Corinthians, where we have, again, Paul's uh, continuing his, his defense of his apostolic ministry. Here he's uh, talking about how... Um, talking about his suffering specifically uh, that he has experienced. And of course, this has caused perhaps some of those at the, in the church at Corinth to question his apostolic ministry and authority uh, because they perhaps didn't feel that they should be suffering as much as they were. And yet Paul kind of wears it as a badge of honor uh, as a, as, uh, as something that is actually good for the, uh, the church and for the ministry, uh, even though uh, it is, it is difficult to go through us, but he says, uh, we are not despairing. We're crushed and perplexed. We are persecuted, but we're not forsaken. We're struck down, but not destroyed. And of course, the context of all that, we kind of use that for any suffering that we endure. The context is that Paul is suffering for the sake of the gospel. Uh, and when you're suffering for the sake of the gospel, it is something that we endure uh, and we uh, do not despair in because uh, ultimately, it's for the glory of God. Uh, and these things, he says, were done for your sakes, verse 15. Um, and to the, so that all this would abound to, again, the glory of God, verse 15. So uh, some great texts for today. And uh, if you are uh, enduring suffering for the gospel, understand that that is uh, for ultimately uh, the glory of God. And so I hope you have a great rest of the day on this day, March 5th, uh, 2021.